So at the beginning of this new season, I had said something about not having any more guests on the show. And of course, rules are made to be broken, right? Recently, I've been focusing a lot on what might be seen as political issues. Uh, but I think from a, let's say, philosophical, spiritual perspective, to some degree at least. And I was uh, recently approached by today's guest to discuss uh, what I do think is a really important issue, which is the uh, outrage culture that has come about as a result of, well, you could say, social and political circumstances, but also the technology that mediates all of our conversations these days. So without further ado, I present to you David Beckemeyer and our very calm and measured conversation about outrage. Hope you enjoy it. Yeah, maybe just uh, tell us a bit about how you got interest in this particular issue and what you're hoping to accomplish with your uh, focusing attention on it. Yeah. So, you know, I, I guess we had the, I kind of reached my own kind of outrage overload, if you will. Right. Um, uh, I, you know, you, we had sort of some changes over the years and then we kind of this political debate stuff has just kind of heated up and heated up. And I think it got to the point where I kind of hit, you know, I think my last straw was kind of a, probably some of the stuff around, I don't know, campaign emails just seemed to get more and more, intense uh, people around me talking about losing friends and family, maybe, com you know, w with the pandemic and lockdowns kind of, you know, adding to that. Um, and so I kind of started to research some of this and political polarization and kind of the state of the divide in the country and things like that. And it seemed like there's room for a conversation about this. And um, so that's kind of where this started. And I kind of started to latch on to this idea of kind of the outrage media and, and outrage engine, if you will, or outrage machine or chaos machine and all these different names that have kind of been given to it. Um, and sort of looked at that and said, oh, that's a topic we can talk about and started to go down that rabbit hole and kind of look into that. And that started me also looking into like, is this a vlog? Do I just write a, blo a regular blog, a vlog, or what am I doing here, if anything? And, and that started getting me to do these things I call these man on the street interviews, where I talk to like regular people uh, about and this was like for research to see if this was even an interesting topic long before I even start, knew what I was going to start. And, and I really found that enlightening for me to talk to people across, you know, political spectrums and generational spectrums and things like that. And just really go into listen mode and hear like what people have to say. And that was very eye opening for me. And then that helped me kind of, you know, work towards, think towards a, a, a podcast idea where I kind of um, sort of juxtapose the, the academic stuff, talking to scientists, researchers, authors, things like that, with kind of this human side of talking to, you know, kind of the visceral side of talking to how this applies in, to real people in their lives and stuff. And so that's kind of where, what, I, what I've been doing with it. What, uh, what do you think was the most eye-opening aspect of that on-the-street-level conversation with, uh, with people who weren't necessarily thinking about these things in those terms? You know, yeah, for me, it was really um, what I've sort of characterized as what I call kind of a worldview gap, because we live in our bubbles where we're just not prepared for the differences in our beliefs and our worldview. And it makes, I think it really makes it a challenge to have dialogue because you sort of go in thinking we're closer to the same page and we realize we're a lot farther apart than we thought we were. Like we, we talk a lot about this common, people always talk about they that find our commonalities and all that. And there are things there. Like I think you can find things at the deeper moral ethics side and things like that, that, that we do have in common, but some of our beliefs, you know, are pretty different. And, and I think that really breaks up the dialogue because you literally kind of get shocked. Like you hear the, a person say a thing that to you sounds like they're just crazy practically, right? And I think it breaks down the dialogue pretty fast for people. Um, and it makes it hard to, to, to because we, and, and so we haven't heard that before because even in my case, I was in the beginning, I was just trying to find whoever would talk to me. And often that was somebody I knew. And it would be friends sometimes from, you know, maybe different places on the political spectrum and different from where I'm at. And, uh, I had never really had that deep of a conversation like that because we often just 
out of politeness or concern for your friendship or whatever, even people I've known for a long time. We never took things that deep just because, you know, we, we don't really want to take a gamble on that. But when I was kind of in that just listen mode, I'm not going to argue, I'm not trying to change your mind, I'm not, you know, going to send back a bunch of my thoughts on things, I'm just going to hear where you're at. You know, you could really hear, they would really open up and tell you things that I didn't know about people that I had known for years. Hmm. Um, you know, that was really eye-opening for me. Yeah. So to what extent do you think the approach of uh, thinking of this in sort of, let's say, outrage culture terms, has that made it more possible to have conversations with people? Or do you pretty much have to stay in listen mode in order for things to continue <laughs> uh, in a smooth fashion? <laughs> Well, you know, and I'm, you know, and the podcast isn't necessarily about, well, it is a little bit, but it's not because I do talk about it, but it's not necessarily just about kind of how do you talk to people or how do you change people's mind and stuff. That is probably the thing everybody wants. Like when I first was circulating the idea or socializing the idea of what, what this is about, and even sometimes people that see just the title, Outrage Overload, they think, oh, great, you're going to tell me how to fix, you know, the Democrats or how to fix the Republicans, right? You're going to tell me how to do that. Uh, and, and you know, it's not really about that. Although, you know, I have had interviews with people working in the space, like civil dialogue kind of efforts and things like that, and, uh, you know, better dialogue and better conflict even, right? Uh, although that's not my main thing. I do talk to experts about that. You know, for me, how much has it changed me at that? I mean, for me, uh, it's mostly, I think, something like what you're saying. It, 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 you know, I try to stay, I try to, it's difficult. I mean, it's a, what I've learned about it is it's really hard, and you really have to put a lot of effort in to, to do that. So, for me, the first sort of ask for my listeners is, is sort of educating them about this divide and also asking us to be more critical of ourselves and critical of our own side. Because when I do these man on the street interviews, I ask things like, have you recognized this and that kind of thing? And everybody's quick to sort of point out the other side doing it. But, you know, I kind of ask them, have you seen you, have you, do you see it in your side sometimes and on people that you supposedly agree with uh, doing it? And, and I think that's kind of one of my biggest asks is let's be more, let's have a lens about that a little bit more and be uh, conscious of when we're doing it and be conscious when it's, you know, people kind of on our side are, kind of doing it to us. Uh, but in terms of me being better at it, um, I'm, I think I'm better at, yeah, not doing the reaction so much because I try to keep that lens on. And, and particularly, you know, I think it's better for stress levels too, you know. So I also talk about sort of, you know, managing things like how much, so how you do social media from, from experts. I don't necessarily say I know all the answers, but I try to bring on experts that talk about that, kind of managing your social media engagement and how you use it, when you use it, things like that, that can help just lower our individual stress. I mean, not necessarily trying to fix the whole country, but maybe you can at least lower your own stress. So that, that all has helped with me. And, you know, in terms of, you know, talking with other people, I mean, a lot of it has been, you know, A, I realize, hey, I need to apologize to some people for my past behavior, right? And mm -hmm. maybe some of it starts with that. And, but, you know, and I, but I also, I think a bigger one to me is just realizing how difficult those kind of talks are and how much um, sort of cognitive and emotional battery capacity you have to kind of build up to go into one to, to do it well. Yeah. So I guess one of the questions is, uh, how did we get here? <laughs> you know, and, um, you know, everyone to some extent is relying on some base of information in order to form their sense of what's happening in the world. And that seems to be a, a place where we might focus some attention in order to get a sense of the extent to which we can rely on the information that we're using in order to form our positions. But part of it also seems to be that it's essentially a cohort issue. So, you know, because we happen to be amongst the people who we happen to be amongst, and whether it's in work or family, what you were raised in, there are certain things which are just sort of part of the culture. And there are people who rebel against those things. But I think it's particularly difficult to do that in a work environment. If there's a strong culture of a particular slant, that can be extremely problematic. And so it's just a lot easier for people to go along with things uh, without even really examining whether or not uh, they hold water. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I kind of refer to this as a little bit of the litmus test stuff a little bit, right? Where you sort of got to signal your loyalty to the tribe sort of thing. I, I think what you see there, like in that work environment situation, if you 
aren't on the same page with everybody, you tend to just self silence a little bit, right? You tend to try to, if I want to keep working here or I want to get along with my coworkers, I may need to, uh, you kind of roll it back and let some of it slide and just kind of not engage a lot. And, you know, and particularly if, if there are, you know, people that are more extreme that have kind of ended up dominating a workplace, that can be a bigger problem. But, but yeah, so I, I think we, we find a lot of that, um, that we do kind of self silence, which can be a challenge. And we, and we then go back to our tribe, you know, when we can, right. For our, for, our, um, sort of our safety net, we go back into our little little bubbles. And and that's a bit of a problem. I mean, I'm sure you're familiar with like the Putnam work, the whole bowling at home, uh, bowling alone sort of thing that we don't get involved in community as much because of these things. And also just the general sorting that has happened over the last 50 years, where we're sorted not only geographically, we're sorted by all kinds of demographics, ideology, and a bunch of other stuff, which tends to make it so we don't interact very much with people that are far unless we're pretty extreme for our world, unless we're a rare case, we tend to not interact that much. And so it's with uh, people with kind of strongly differing views. And so it can start to feel, everybody thinks they're normal. This is another, you asked earlier, some of the takeaways. Another takeaway that was kind of, that's been surprised. I don't know if it's surprising, but it's been very interesting to me is sort of everybody thinks they're a moderate. You know, it's an exaggeration, but I mean, everybody, you know, and I, I, and I, you know, hear these things, like I say, I'm just in listen mode. And, you know, I think a lot of objective, I mean, it, it, the whole definition of objective observer is a challenge anyway, right? Who, how objective is anyone? But the closest thing to an objective observer would probably pit some of these people pretty far down one side or the other, right? But they've defined a new normal that everybody kind of thinks they're the norm and er anybody that's different from them is is extreme. So if you're pretty far right, it's the same thing. If like, yeah, you always find people that maybe that are more right and say they're the extreme ones, but I'm normal. I'm in the middle. And anybody that even slightly, you know, center from where I am is an extreme liberal and vice versa. The same thing with people on the on the blue side. And it's kind of a funny thing that this is the delusion that we all think we're normal or we're the baseline. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Certainly in recent times, we've seen a far more complex segmenting of society so that the kind of standard division of blue red is maybe really not as applicable as it once was because there are just so many different issues that people attach themselves to one position or another and it can get incredibly complex. I don't see anything to indicate that there's uh, a necessary pairing of any of these issues on either sort of side of the political spectrum. There's quite often people who are really mixing and matching on all these various wedge issues. Well, I'm going to push back on that because, you know, th this gets down to this issue of issue versus ideology sort of thing where, you know, and a lot of studies have shown this where, you know, you do attach to that ideology, even if you even, don't even know that you don't agree on some of the issues, right? You may still have issue positions that are that actually do cross uh, the 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 blue red divide, but uh, you don't even necessarily know it because you do identify still with that tribe. So you know you get these things that say you know, you tell a liberal that this po liberal policy was proposed by Trump and they say, well, that's a terrible policy, right? Um, and likewise, you do the same thing to somebody that's, a, that's a, on the red side. You can say this policy is a very, you know, the Democrats love this policy, even if it was something Trump actually proposed. And and they'll do the same thing. Well, that's terrible. Or I love it because, you know, they'll, you can tell them Trump proposed it and they'll love it, even if it's a liberal policy. So we're not that attached to our issue, our, our ideologies in some way that than we think we are. We're, we're more attached to that tribe labeling. Um, and so that's that. So I think it's, I, I totally agree that there definitely are narrower and you can find yourself in narrow or narrower bands so that your bubble can be more um, narrow or more, more specific. Uh, that's definitely true, but you still, people still seem to tend to put themselves in this red or blue bucket in, in America. And, and, and you're, and certainly there are, if you're a fringe person that you do have the cross, you're, you have, you have issue positions that cross, you often have to self silence that or your own tribe will, you know, the, back to that litmus test sort of thing, your own tribe will attack you for saying, Oh, you know, I agree with the Republicans on this. And I agree with the Democrats on that. That's a hard position for anybody to take these days. Right. I mean, um, you know, you have this kind of independent group that sometimes can get away with that, but you know, for a lot of people, they don't, that's a, I mean, like, like even with this podcast, I get, you know, 
pressure from both sides to be harsher on the other side in some way, right? Whichever the other side uh, means means to them. So, and I, and I wouldn't be surprised if you hear some of that same thing with your podcast. But um, so I, I don't know if I agree with that. That that we have a lot of people that have that that identify as some Republican and some um, some some uh, Democrat. I just I just don't see that. Well, I think you know it's quite possible that. You know, you know, two contradictory trends can be happening at the same time. So, you know, the example that you gave, I think, you know, if correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it does indicate the idea that you could have someone like Trump offering what might be what would ordinarily be thought of as a liberal policy. Right. And, and so that's the kind of cross hatching that I see happening a lot. And I, I would say that I'm probably someone who's relatively on the fringe and i don't identify as being either blue or red i come from like a blue background you could say but i'm really in no way uh part of that group anymore and so i'm i, I consider myself politically homeless essentially and, and i think there's a lot of people like you i mean i, I kind of feel the same way yeah and uh, and that's in a way what I'm talking about. I'm uh, and and part of this also has to do with the fact that we have a media that can infinitely split. And so you know, in a way, these podcasts are an expression of that. Whereas in the past, we had you know essentially monoliths. We had you know CBS. We had the, uh, CBS, NBC, ABC, PBS, <laughs> and then Fox showed up. Right. So that was a relatively small number of media outlets there was some more diversity perhaps in the uh in the press for a while but a lot of that all got gobbled up and so we had this gigantic kind of consolidation process that happened through the 90s but because of the internet uh all of these uh small outfits could find a niche you know and quite often it is something you know like if you listen to libertarian uh points of view uh, it's really quite an incredible mix of uh, attitudes from left and right. You know, a lot of them are very anti-war. A lot of them are very much about, you could say, uh, kind of social liberals, uh, but they're very oftentimes economically conservative. So that's the kind of thing I'm talking about, is that we're seeing it on a, you know, one way of viewing it would be that there's, kind of a fragmentation happening in society when it comes to a narrative yeah and i and i and i still think it's a little bit of a it's still a minority in some way right i mean i i think there kind of is maybe i want to say that wrong because i i think there kind of is um you know i i think i was talking i was talking to the people that are running the um the dignity index. I don't know if you've looked at that, but but they have a thing they kind of call the exhausted majority. Um, you know, which which maybe maybe that's similar to what you're talking about. That there's a lot of people out there that do have those opinions, but they definitely get lost in the noise from the from the loud ma majority of ones that you know wear a red hat proudly or wear a blue hat proudly and uh you know really take up the cause for the red or blue and and you know quickly a quick note on the thing you said about the trump thing and trump's a little bit of a unique example but he's also kind of a good model to use because he really pushes those limits but you know you, the example that you used was trump really proposing a you know something that might have been in the past considered a liberal view and that that does happen i mean trump did some of that um and you know but the other thing that some of this research showed if you just told people that trump said the thing even if it was really proposed by somebody on the left if you just told people trump did it then they suddenly supported it and vice or vice versa um you know you could tell a, somebody on the left that trump supported their own policy and they would say oh that's a terrible policy right yeah he's like a narrative sorting machine i mean basically <laughs> you, you, you can rely on uh, a certain type of reaction as soon as something comes out of this guy's mouth, you know? What and I was saying, though, that this research showed even if he didn't actually say it, if you just told people <laughs> he said it, then they, they would go for that policy or go against it, depending on which side. And, and you could say that that's actually happened a number of times, too. <laughs> Where he just said he was going to do it and then never really did, you mean? Well, no, no, no. Where it was reported that he said something that he didn't actually say. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Well, and he's he, he was always one of those guys that I, I was one thing about him. I always wondered about he, he, like people would ask me, do you support? Him? I'm not sure because I don't even know what he stands for. Right. Because he kind of sometimes would just change his mind and I couldn't tell. I might support him. This sounds pretty good, but let's see what he says Tuesday. Yeah. Well, you know, that's not unusual for politicians. Uh, right. But, 
you know, he has a, a, an extreme case, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's kind of extreme in all levels, right, about that kind of thing. So in some ways, he's a good model for that, that you can kind of demonstrate things like that. But in other ways, he might be kind of unique. Like, there may be only one. <laughs> Nobody's, there's no substitute. <laughs> well, it does seem like he's treated that way. And, you know, he has, let's say, uh, operated as the trump card in the deck for his entire life. So, you know, that that's a strange role you know because in essence you don't get to play that role without the consent of the media you know he he's he's someone who's essentially as i see it a media creature he he's more a media creature than he was ever a serious businessman as far as i can tell you know and and certainly the his most recent roles have been reality tv star prior to this uh, presidential run right so that's a media role. He's a, he's a media creature. And uh, you don't get to play that role without the approval of the producers. He's, he's someone who has worked with you know, the highest level of the mainstream media for most of his life. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and he definitely has an innate sort of uh, talent for it as well. Like he, he knows kind of how to, he, he, he outfoxed everybody in terms of kind of knowing what the, wh where these bullet points were that he could tap into. And he just, you know, all the research in the world, you know, spent a bunch of money and here he comes along and just knows instinctively. Which buttons know, to, to push. Yeah. And part of it is that, yeah. you know, what we've been kind of mapping out, I think, over the last few minutes of the conversation are, you know, narrative differences, ideological differences. But then the question is like, what is it that now pushes it into outrage territory? And, and he's a guy who has leveraged what I would say was kind of a natural outrage that had been building for a long time. And so, you know, one of the things I'm interested in hearing your thoughts on is, well, first of all, how would you characterize outrage? I mean, I think everyone kind of has a gut instinct as to what it means, but it would be interesting to hear that. And then it seems to me like there's two basic types of outrage. There's an outrage that you could say is completely justifiable on a certain level that has to do with real things that have happened to people and then there is this kind of cultivated outrage that happens uh you know as a result of let's say people who are able to create more outrage for various purposes whether they're political or for a grift or what have you so yeah what are your thoughts along those lines Sure. So, yeah, I mean, on your first thing, yeah, Trump didn't invent, didn't really cause all these um, divides, right? I mean, he just knew where they were and knew how to sort of drive a wedge into them. Um, I, I, but yeah, so, um, yeah, I mean, I use the term outrage as almost like kind of a conceptual term. It's mostly about emotions like fear and anger and, and moral indignation. And I, and I use the term outrage porn a, a lot. I didn't invent that term, but uh, I think uh, Tim Reader at New York Times, I think, was decided to use that first. But, you know, and I, I like that term a lot because you have the outrage side, which, like I say, is kind of this emotional, like they're trying to create these emotions of fear and anger, especially in moral indignation. And the porn side, because we actually like it, like we want it. We, we, it lets us feel superior over the other side. We like to be tortured and we like to watch hear about the other side doing bad things because that makes us feel superior and we get then we can get that self-esteem boost and all that out of it so i love that term outrage porn actually right because i think it's so much the case um and yeah you're absolutely right i actually did an episode on sort of because people asked me about well what if the outrage is justified um and yeah, so this is, the, but this, and this is the, this is why the podcast is kind of called Outrage Overload because outrage does have a place, right? It can be a motivating tool. Uh, it can be an organizing tool, let's say. So if you look at a Me Too movement or something like that, or in the past civil rights and things like that, you know, outrage can be, and, and obviously in our, you say, how did we get here? Well, millions of years of evolution. If you look in our past, outrage was a way to sort of enforce the rules of the tribe and things like that, right? So outrage has a role. But if you're always at, you know, 11, then it can't do that motivating thing because like, if you have a thing and you're all calm and then this thing happens and we all agree this is a bad thing, we want to do something about it, then outrage can be an organizing tool. But if we're always outraged about everything, then it, that, that tool of it goes around. Plus, it, has, or it goes away. Plus, we have all kind of <laughs> terrible health side effects from being stressed out and mad and angry all the time, right? And, and we also have this sort of distraction, you know, the, the, if you go kind of on the Zen side and the Eastern philosophy, which sort of knew about this, seems to, seem to know about 
a lot of the stuff we're in the West are trying to figure, you know, figure it out just now that they've known for centuries, you know, things like when you're in that rage state, you know, you can't, you, you, you can't process things well. And, and so you, you are in, less effective especially if you're in that state all the time. So, you know, you can, if you lower that temperature, then you can look at things and, and have your cognitive brain get activated a little bit better. And so, you know, that's, that's I, I think you're absolutely right. There are these uh, legitimately outrageous things, but it's, it's kind of a pick your battles problem, right? I mean, I can't be outraged at everything all the time. And I also think, you know, this is more, I don't, I don't want to sound conspiracy theory-ish, but I mean, I think both sides like to keep us in, in, in outraged all the time because then we, you know, we're just mad at the other side and they don't have to, if we're mad at the other side, if, if they can convince us the other side is evil, you're not going to vote for evil. So they can sort of do whatever they want. They're, you're not going to vote for evil. Yeah. So, you know, to, it's there in their best interest. It's not in our best interest. If you're blue and I'm red or vice versa, you know, it's not in our best interest, either of us, for them to get us mad all the time. So we just think you're evil because we'll never have a dialogue. We'll never have a, we'll never have that debate that sort of makes democracy work. Uh, we'll just consider you evil. I'd never vote for you. I'm, 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 I'm not even going to let you in the room, basically, to have a conversation. I don't even want you to exist. Um, and so anyway, so I think there's a, you know, obviously there's benefits to the major parties to keep us enraged all the time. Yeah. I mean, it's a classic kind of divide and conquer mechanism, you know, uh, there was an interesting example of that recently on, you know, what might be considered kind of a fringe enterprise, but there was this uh, anti-war demonstration in D.C. last weekend, and it was organized by, I believe it was libertarians, but of course there's anti-war groups on the left, a number of them withdrew their speakers because they didn't like some of the people who were involved in organizing the rally, uh, which is... You know, it's kind of ridiculous. I mean, it's it's a relatively pathetic showing in, uh, you know, the anti-war movement doesn't have a lot of uh, momentum these days. And you, you would think that that would be a group that could put aside their differences, even just, you know, for a weekend at least, to focus on what they consider to be the most important issue, which is an incredibly important issue, incredibly consequential, and they were some of them were unable to do that. I think that kind of thing is happening all over the place. And it just shows just how deeply that divisive mechanism works. It's incredibly effective at uh, eliminating the power of the people. Yeah, and it, it, I think it also ties a little bit in to, back to that kind of litmus test thing we talked about in the beginning, too. I mean, some of those people were probably reluctant to get involved, to, to, to have their involvement in that that aspect that movement or that rally or whatever known because it had was associated with maybe people that would be like you shouldn't associate you're not supposed to associate with those people like you're not allowed to associate with those people or you're going to get you know ostracized or kicked out of your own tribe so i think there's some of that going on there too that you you're gonna you have to roll out you have to roll out of it or you're gonna you you can't stay in your tribe you you lose your credibility within your own tribe so i mean i think you have a lot of that kind of thing i mean i think we we i've worked in racial justice um in the past and kind of still do to a degree. And, you know, and you see that there too. It's like, you know, there's a lot of that. It can be a challenge to the whole call in and calling in, calling out problem and stuff like that. I also see it. I think we saw it with the women's movement, uh, women's March movement. They had a lot of that kind of turmoil going on um, where, you know, different people had to opt out of it eventually because they felt like they couldn't be associated with, you know, different things. And, you know, you, so you see this, uh, that kind of thing happen a lot where, you know, they're going to use these, the signaling of who wears what hat overarches the cause you're trying to do because like, you know, I can't get involved now because this person's involved. Yeah. So uh, do you uh, have any sense of how that might be addressed? Like uh, uh, identifying that as an issue. So is there a way in which, uh, I, I mean, I, I'm not even sure how to characterize it, but it seems <laughs> like healing, the the divide within groups that are ostensibly coming together around a common cause you know yeah one of the, this is one of the um, main areas where uh, my audience is constantly you know sort of saying you know so what do we do about it you know what and so they're constantly looking for sort of prescriptive advice and you know and so I'm kind of early on I've only you know I'm only sort of a you know, a half dozen episodes in and another half dozen or well, more than that kind of cued and interviews done and stuff. So I'm only so far into it. And so far, you know, and I ask every guest that I have, every featured guest, every expert, 
you know, for this kind of thing, like, what can we do about it? And I have to say from the academia side, most of them are pretty much doomsayers, right? <laughs> most of them basically don't have a lot of advice. They're like, well, my first episode was titled buckle up because that's what Peter Ditto said. Like, here's what you do. Buckle up. We're in it. This is the fight. We're in this fight. It's not going to go away anytime soon. Hmm. So, uh, but, but I've had a, you know, so, so, so far, most of the prescriptive stuff has been on the more small scale. Like I don't have an answer to how to solve the universe right now. I'm sort of more focusing on us as individuals. Like if you can change you and you can maybe change your start working up from there through your tribe, you know, that's kind of where I'm starting now. Uh, I, I did do one, I've done one interview with, um, it, there was a, uh, you know, in terms of like structural changes and things like that, you know, we have a First Amendment, you know, challenge here in this country that lets you say stupid things, it lets you lie even, and you can almost commit, you know, you can even say bad things about people and usually get away with it because it's pretty hard to prove, uh, you know, defamation and all that, right? So, that can be a sort of a problem because disinformation can kind of almost carry the same weight as anything else. And and so, that's kind of a problem here if you want to try to regulate things. But there was somebody, this guy C. Edwin Baker was doing research on this 20 years ago, and he he, he passed away um, kind of early. And, and so, he, but other people have kind of taken up that work. And he presents how there are regulatory and legal things that could happen, you know, at different levels and things like that, and talks about the economics of how that could, you know, why, because, you know, this is, at the end of the day, if you talk to like, I talked to Jeffrey Berry, who wrote, you know, the book Outrage the outrage industry. This is 2014. This book came out. So he was talking about talk radio and things like that, but all of it still applies because at the end of the day, it's a media market and it's a marketplace problem, right? If you have a product and there's people that want the product there, it will exist. Someone will produce that product. So if you shut down Fox news or you shut down MSNBC, it's not going to change anything. Somebody else is going to come in and fill that market void. Right. You know, but he has ideas about how this market works and talks about how antitrust in a media context doesn't work the way it works with widgets, right? So it doesn't work the way it works in normal production world because the product is us, right? I mean, we're the product and we're being sold to advertisers. And so you need a different kind of antitrust model there. And he, he talks about some ways you could do that, you know, and, and so that those people had hope that things could happen, but it's a slow process and you've got to get sort of the will. And so, and they also reference some things that are happening. I, I don't happen to have all those references with me now, but I can send you some for, for show notes and stuff. But, you know, so they, they're a little bit more hopeful that maybe some structural things could happen, but almost all of the uh, prescriptive advice that I've got so far has kind of been more bottom up. It's sort of been, and some of it sounds cliche, you know, just like, don't, you know, use social media at better times, use it different ways, stuff like that. Right. So, you know, it sounds like when it comes to a top down approach, you would have to have uh, some sort of new regulatory framework that would require political capital in order to accomplish it. But uh, it seems like there's just too much a political expediency to allowing things to continue as it is to really realistically think that that could happen. And so we are kind of left to this uh, mode of just it's our personal responsibility to try to not destroy our own lives <laughs> with this thing. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so uh, maybe we could talk about a concrete example at the intersection between, uh, let's call it uh, legitimate outrage grievances and what kind of dovetails into this uh, outrage industry. While I really would prefer to not use Trump as an example, I just feel like he's he just takes up way too much bandwidth. We've already blown it on that in this episode and talked about <laughs> yeah, right. it. So we may as well <laughs> right. continue to flush out that story a little bit. I think a lot of people were just simply outraged by the fact of his election. So there was there was that kind of reaction, which I think was unusual. I think in the past, there would be disappointment and condemnation of the opponent who had won. But in this case, it really was a, a new level of outrage. But the thing on the ground that I think a lot of liberals never consider is that he was leveraging an existing outrage in middle America, basically the, the industrial uh, sector that had been decimated by globalism. And so all the jobs that got shifted overseas, all of the towns and factories that were destroyed, basically, uh, there, you know, a, a, a comfortable middle class existence had essentially evaporated for a pretty significant portion of the United States population. And 
That led to outrage because these were people who felt betrayed by their government. And that was essentially the groundswell. That was the raw material that a few decades later allowed Trump to leverage his position and, and, and get into office. That At least that's the way I see it. Well, yeah, so I'm going to say... Let me add one more, yeah, one yeah, more quick thing to that, right? And so you have that initial kind of outrage response to his being elected and then you have that outrage that was there to begin with that had people latch on to a candidate such as trump but then you had the response which i think was summed up by hillary clinton during the campaign talking about the people who supported trump as deplorables which added fuel to the fire of the outrage that p these people had been not only completely abandoned as far as they were concerned by their government, but now they were being essentially insulted and demeaned <laughs> for choosing an alternative to the, to the system that had betrayed them, or at least what they perceived as being an alternative, right? And so you can see that the confluence of, of things which essentially fan the flames of outrage right and it's all very understandable yeah for sure i'm gonna i'm gonna i i don't want to get into a lot large conversation about it. i think the reason for some of that grievance that resulted in trump probably i don't agree with the globalism and some of that i but i but i do agree with a lot of the rest of it and i you know and i, I kind of don't even want to go down that path because let's say that they were aggrieved for various reasons and and i, I I'll, for now I'll, I'll agree with that and and you know and i i think that statement by by uh clinton what is a good example of the of that of how you arrive at that grievance right because uh you know one of the aspects of that grievance is not all of it but one of the aspects of that grievance is is that feeling of you know constantly being you know called out or you know in in various ways and 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 sort of in a snarky way right i mean there's this kind of image of the left is const is kind of often kind of presents themselves like we won the battle see our we're so much smarter look here you know that we've we've done this and i think there's a lot of that that plays into that grievance as well there's a lot of a sense and and, and some of it has been fed by their own campaign just like the left gets mad about trump the before that you know you had kind of the new gingriches and all that really pushing they really switched over to this grievance kind of model. So Trump, you know, just blew it out of proportion, right? I mean, Trump just lashed onto it and accelerated, but it had sort of been happening for a while, you know, I mean, you know, and you get, you get, so, so, uh, so, so yeah, you, you had this grievance sitting there that Trump knew was knew existed. Um, and, you know, and when you get to this issue and yeah, and, and many, much of it is very well, you know, like you say, it's sort of legitimate, right? It's a real thing. And this is something else. I, when I talk about that worldview gap that, you know, um, like I say, a lot of people say, yeah, this outrage stuff is bad because, you know, and they'll end it with because the left does this or because the right is always doing it. You know, it's like, um, you know, not realizing that it's happening to you and your side's doing it too. I, I think there's a, there's a version of that there that that's kind of there too. But yeah, a lot, a lot of it was very much, yeah, and that statement was so perfect because, yeah, you could argue she said it. She said it was some of them, but it doesn't really matter, right? Because when you say a thing like that to people in the other tribe, it doesn't matter that you said some of them are like are are deplorable, right? That, that kind of that little qualifier doesn't really matter when you use a word like deplorable, right? So, well, I think actually the term that she used was a basket of deplorables, isn't that right? Yeah, she said some of them are in a basket of deplorables. So there's a basket, yeah, but she, it was definitely qualified that there was it was a subset. <laughs> It wasn't everybody, but it doesn't sort of matter when you say somebody's sort of deplorable and they're in your tribe, you know, that's probably not a great, that's not going to work, right? That's, that's going to feed that grievance. And, and, and like you say, it kind of exacerbates this idea of from the right. This is another thing I get from these, um, man, I've gotten from, and it's also in the research. It's not, this is not just for those man on the street interviews because this whole grievance thing exists on both sides. But, um, but yeah, that, that, that kind of language going to feed that grievance thing and that and feed that uh feeling that the other side thinks they're superior to me and that's going to piss me off and now i feel superior to them because they feel superior to me you know what i mean it's almost like a feedback loop that both sides start doing that that the, the other side feels superior that makes them less you know that makes them lessers so i'm better than them and uh you know so you get that kind of stuff and i think the the left is just not good 
at seeing they're part of the problem. Like they do that. Like they insult people. They use this kind of language that does that kind of thing. And, and they're snarky. And, you know, uh, I, I think on the, you know, I, I, I think about like on the right, you sort of have the Rush Limbaugh types. They're sort of out there screaming outrage on the left. You sort of have the, the late night comedians, um, you know, using irony and satire to, to do the same thing, but they're not screaming. Yeah. So gee, they don't use outrage. Yeah. But they're saying really mean things. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So it's kind of a big, big tear down. But you know, one of the things that, that uh, strikes me as being a question in all of this is the extent to which because you were saying earlier that uh, a lot of people like this, like, they really get invested in it in various ways, they're out there deeply attracted to it, and it fulfills some kind of uh, need that they have. And so, you know, one of the things that I've wondered is, you know, what would happen if if it weren't available to them? I mean, there's a lot of aggression that goes into this stuff. People are kind of exercising their demons in a certain way. Uh, you know, in the past, like grievances might lead to something like a civil war, right? And so, you know, some of the grievances are relatively deep and along those lines, you know? But it seems like what's been happening is that people are increasingly playing out their grievances in a more symbolic way. And, you know, while it's ugly and and really annoying and aggravating, it may actually be reducing the chances of there being a far more serious kind of, uh, of political movement, essentially, where you would actually end up with something along the lines of a civil war. You know, like... I don't know if we want to get into another example, but this whole January 6th, 6, right? January 6th thing uh, is painted by one side as uh, a literal insurrection, which, you know, I think from the point of view of anyone who's studied insurrections is pretty ridiculous. <laughs> but nevertheless, uh, you know, some people were... Uh, aggravated to the point where they marched in there and wandered around in there for a while. And there was a lot of noise, right? But the idea that it was, it was, it was going to threaten the government in some way seems far fetched, I guess I would have to say. Um, and now like, so in a way it was like a, a, a play acting of an insurrection that everyone can now argue over and, and get out all of that energy without having an actual insurrection to deal with. So I, I'm not sure if I'm, I'm making that point very well, but I guess partially what I'm saying here is that things have moved over to the symbolic. And, and on some level, maybe that actually isn't the worst thing that could happen. Like I remember noticing at some point when they changed the, um, the setup on airplanes so that we're not all watching one movie anymore. It used to be that there would be a, a screen every 15 feet and then you got the little screen right in front of your own seat and i thought wow you know we can't even all sit on an airplane for a few hours and watch the same movie anymore and maybe that's what we need like maybe that actually is going to keep the world more civil for a little while longer <laughs> you know not ideal right but it may be that that's where we are. Like we, we you know, because part of the story here is that we have an unbridgeable divide between narratives. It's kind of a Babylon situation from the, the point of view of like the, the old world thinking about what Babylon represented. It's a confusion of tongues. People can't relate to each other. And yet we're all in the same civilization. And so how do we manage that? You know, well, part of it is the, these, these symbolic kind of battles. Yeah, well, I mean, so you're sort of suggesting that maybe it's kind of a blow off steam that way, and somehow that'll keep it from getting getting worse. Potentially, I mean, yeah. I, I think that yeah. it doesn't help with the challenge of you know, sort of, we still have to do stuff, and right now it's like, we're just in this seesaw mode, right, where when one party gets in in charge, they do some stuff, and then the other party comes and they kind of undo that stuff and do some different stuff, and it's just like back and forth, and and um. And we can't. And nothing's getting done. <laughs> At the end, nothing's getting done because it's sort of two steps forward, yeah. three steps back, kind of thing. Um, and that seesawing, I think, you know, is is going to be, you know, kind of just get worse because if we do need to do something, you know, it's going to be like it's going to be, 
you know, it's going to be so hard to agree even on, well, and I come back to this a lot. Like I did an episode about this specific topic because I have, you know, I had a lot of people talk about what if it's legitimately outrageous or what if, you know, and what's, what if it's objectively good or bad? What if it's objectively something we can all agree on? And I've sort of said, that's a hard thing to find. Like it's way harder to find things that we objectively agree on than we think, than we think it is, right? Because why we walk into a room and say, well, this is obviously everyone agrees about this, right? Nope. You know, you've got 40% of people that don't agree with that. Uh, you know, I, I picked as an objective, something objectively that we could, you know, most of us, you have to be pretty extreme to, to, to say this. But so, I mean, you have to be pretty extreme to say that the Holocaust is not a real thing. So I picked Holocaust denial. So that's something we can, most of us, most people, certainly a pretty large majority could agree the Holocaust actually happened. And there's massive mm-hmm. amounts of data for that and stuff like that. But that's a pretty low bar that I had to go back to a Holocaust <laughs> as a thing we could agree happened, right? And if you try to find other things that are, um, you know, uh, common ground and stuff, I mean, one of the, the, uh, one of the, 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 I, I had like a, a couple of different mediators and things, professional mediators and things like that kind of talk about. Uh, it, a lot of times our, our divide is talked about like it's a toxic marriage. So I actually had like a sex therapist and say, if we call the, this problem like a metaphor for a toxic marriage, it's a toxic mm. marriage. We kind of can't get a divorce in, right? So what do you do when you're in a toxic marriage and uh, stuff like that? So I had one mediator t- talk to me about, well, you know, you, to tra- try to humanize the other side, you can – and to get to this point of what's something we can objectively agree on, they were saying like, well, you can start with, you know, would that person pull my kid out of a burning car? Mm. Right. And that's, again, a pretty low bar, but at least you can sort of say, I can maybe give them a little bit of their humanity back if I think they'd, they'd and if they wouldn't pull your kid out of a burning car, then yeah, maybe you're done with that person. <laughs> right. But, yeah. but, but if they would pull your kid out of a burning car, it's at least a starting point. And, and then the next step would be, can you, find three things good to say about that person. And, you know, you probably can, you could probably find three things, but even if you can't, the way our brains work, even that process of trying to find three things actually helps you humanize them a little bit. But if you take those two examples, sort of Holocaust on the one side and would they pull my kid out of a burning car? That's a pretty low bar, right? I mean, um, and so what people think that bar is like, we should all agree about this, right? Nope. You won't agree about that. Uh, I, I think a good metaphor for this is I posted in in a group that purports to be sort of a, a civil pol- political discussion page on Facebook. I reported the thing about that dignity dignity index. I keep having a trouble pronouncing that. Uh, that the dignity index that uh, I just posted a thing saying here's an effort some people are doing. You know, it looks interesting, pro- possibly promising. Uh, you know, and it might have scaling issues because that's a thing that often comes up with those kind of challenges. So I said, you know, what do you guys think about this? Oh my God! Right? Can you guess how the comment thread went on that topic? With that sort of neutral, here's the thing. What do you guys think about it? <laughs> right? I'm sure it went all over the place, right? It just was. No, it immediately turned into left right divide. We're going to fight over this. Like the left oh, thinks okay, this, yeah. the right thinks that, and it just went all down all these left right divide paths. Right. So you take a thing that seems pretty much, this is not really a left, right thing. Is it like, why is this a left, right thing becomes a left, right thing. And, and they, you know, get in this big debate over everything because everything now is looked at with those lenses. Right. So now I think I kind of lost your original question, (laughs) but that's all right. I mean, that's an interesting, uh, it it seems like that kind of uh, as a recapitulation of what we see happening politically all the time, you know, where something which might transcend that divide gets sucked into the division of that, that primary differential, I guess you could say, uh, you know, which is essentially uh, it, it, like in the presidential uh in terms of like the presidential election, you'd say it's it's the argument that we have to uh, fight against the greater evil. So that that's the thing which presents there from prevents there from being a, an alternative. So third parties are kind of terminally doomed because everyone is so convinced that the other side is such a a, a present danger. And uh, on a certain like, if you think of it almost like physics, like it's impossible to resist the most powerful differential people just get sucked into it i mean i've i've spent a lifetime resisting that i i've always been convinced that that's a terrible political strategy and it can only end in ruin (laughs) but but on the other hand i have to admit that you know 
I'm not accomplishing anything by taking that stand, <laughs> you know? Uh, and it's extremely difficult to convince anyone to not go down the red blue pill path. It seems like that's, you know, there are, I think, uh, again, these kind of spin-off groups. There's, you know, black pillars who just refuse to participate anymore because <laughs> they think it's all doomed, you know? Uh, and there are some interesting uh, fringe ideas. Uh, there's a guy who's uh, promoting this notion of a white pill, which is, how do you characterize that? That, that in many ways, the things that uh, we think we might be heading towards that would be the worst case scenario. We have lessons from history that will probably prevent us from going there. So a lot of people are, are you know, what they're envisioning is uh, the threat of um, some kind of a totalitarian system, uh, something that is, you know, capitalism run amok. Um, and his his point is like, we actually aren't that dumb. We, we, you know, we have learned some things from history and we're not going to replay the horrors of the Holocaust. Right. So God willing, he's right. <laughs> right. <laughs> but I think that uh, on some basic level, those are the fears that motivate that divide, you know, and, and so, you know, perhaps there's something there that, uh, that might help to, you know, not only see the humanity in other people, but to recognize that we're all scared because there are real concerns about, you know, that we have precedent for in history. Yeah, no, I, yeah, it's a good way to look at it. I think, yeah, and, and I'm a, a couple minds on that, you know, because I on, the, on my good days, I guess I would say, yeah, I mean, I think, I, I, I mean, I think some of the experts I've talked to even talk about how even if something like the totalitarian idea happened, you know, there's still half the country that would probably be opposed to that, right? Or maybe more. And so it would have backlash and it would probably be a tough thing to make work. So there's some of that. On the other hand, I think we are particularly um, passive about our rights and we have just always had them and we just believe they'll always be here. And, you know, in some of these cases where democracies have fallen or maybe even just become less democratic and then maybe not fallen, you might say, but, you know, people have lost significant rights and it kind of can happen overnight. And so yeah. you've lived forever kind of thinking that right would just always be there. And then one day it's gone and it can, it can change a lot of things. I mean, I think Twitter, let's take Twitter as an example, whether you're for Elon Musk or not, it's an example of how a regime change at a company can completely change things overnight. And you don't get any say in it, right? I don't have, I'm not on the board. I can't do anything about it. So what's going to yeah. happen with Twitter is what's going to happen with Twitter. So you may have thought Twitter was always going to work a certain way. Uh, and you just built your life around that, built up your 100K followers or whatever you have, one day it changes. Um, and, you know, so I, I think things like that can be signals of, so, so like I said, I'm kind of two minds of that, that, you know, we, um, it's probably not going to, yeah, it, we might, our institutions and other things and our own, and there's a lot of people that just have faith in, in vo our voting populace that they will do these corrections. I mean, you could argue that 2022 was kind of a correction. It was kind of a, you know, what what's the biblical term? You know, you're like, we, we cast you know, shadows on both houses or whatever it is, right? Because they sort of said, yeah. we don't like the, you know, the Democrats have this, so we're not going to let you have full power. But also you Republicans, we're also don't like you and we're not going to let you have full power. So it was kind of a, you know, cast shadow on both houses, I guess. Um, yeah, I think that's it. I, I agree with you on all that. I, I, I'm not so convinced of the white pill formulation, but it, it's nice to see uh, a hopeful case being made. But I think there are some very worrying signs when it comes to rights. You know, uh, what happened in Canada recently, I think, is alarming and not really being noticed very much. And, and I think you're also right that these things can happen very quickly. So it's, I mean, and technology, of course, is suggesting a kind of uh, erosion of human liberty and increased uh, surveillance and, you know, control. So that I think is, is clearly going to become either more of an issue or uh, less of an issue if people just simply accept that trajectory. Yeah. I mean, if you think of, everything Google knows about us because we get that right, right. The price we, we, we get the benefit of convenience and they get the benefit of all that surveillance. Right. 
and if you think of all those things that Google knows about us, again, kind of citing that Twitter example, I mean, we don't control Google. We don't know what they might do. They could have a change in their in their thinking and do something completely different. So now we've got our our, li- our whole lives are tied up to them. You know, our calendar, our email, our you know, all kinds of things are tied up with them. They know everything about us. And Google is just sort of one example, but it's, it's an example a lot of people think, oh, Google's great. We don't have it to worry. Well, do you though? Because you don't have any control over it. You have no idea what they might decide. They did, they did start out with the don't be evil slogan, and somehow or another that disappeared at a certain point. So yeah. <laughs> that doesn't bode well. Yeah. And it's, it was kind of nonsense to begin with. I mean, I'm sorry, you're a multi billion dollar corporation and your don't be evil is going to mean <laughs> something. Are you kidding me? Right. <laughs> Well, idealism, you know, uh, the idealism of youth does have a termination point, right? <laughs> right? So they were they were at one time young idealists, you know, who thought that the techno future was going to be just glorious and liberating. But yeah, that surveillance state stuff, or that I shouldn't say surveillance state, just that sort of surveillance economy is definitely something that uh, I think is a is a potentially big problem, and especially as it gets. The cost of getting off Google, as an example, think about the cost it would take to get. A, I mean, maybe you're good at staying out of it, but I mean, for most of us, they have they have their fingers in it so much of our lives. Yeah, no, it's inconceivable to most people. If you're trying to run a business, good luck, right? Right. But I think when it comes to like that 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 issue of the surveillance state, I mean, it's a reality in China, and in, in many respects, you could say that that's a wet dream for governments around the world. You know? Sure. Uh, so I think that's a real, it's a real threat for the rest of the world as, as well. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, and you know, and you know, again, not going to p- pitch the conspiracy theories, but I mean, I'm sure that there's a lot of arrangements. In fact, being on the inside of that, I know there are with the government and with all a lot of the information that Google knows, right? I mean, obviously there's a lot of privacy things they have to worry about. Then GDPR in Europe might be stronger and some other things in Europe might be stronger, than what we have here. But, you know, a lot of that information is finding its way to the state. No doubt. Yeah. And there's, there's a reason why uh, people from the various three-letter agencies keep ending up at social media companies. <laughs> right. right? <laughs> so what, what was the uh, uh, area that you worked in uh, in tech? Well, so I, I guess if I have a claim to fame, it's any. I was uh, the founding CTO of Earthlink, so I kind of, you know, did that wave of bringing sort of the real internet to ordinary people. You know, we were really the first to that let you set up. It, you know, in the early days, getting on the net in those dial-up days, you know, you had to jump through a ton of hoops and do a bunch of manual config. We were one of the first that had an AOL type thing where we had a, you know, AOL in those days was was not the internet; it was a walled garden. So we we gave you a disk you could put in your PC, and ten minutes later or five minutes later, you'd be online and up and running and using the real internet, the open internet or at that time, what might have been the open internet, uh, and, and it'd all be working. So it would configure all that software that when you had to do it yourself would have been you know hours and screwing around and downloading. Where So we had, a, we had that going. That was kind of what we did. So we brought you know real internet to regular people with the same kind of convenience that AOL had and basically pushed AOL to then switch over to actually offer the real internet later. Yeah, I mean, it, it, sort of through a portal. It was like... A <laughs> yeah, it was always through a portal. Uh, something on the side, yeah. But yeah, I was I was one of your customers back in the day. Oh, there you go. Awesome. Uh, so it was a great service. Cool. Well, uh, I, I feel like we've covered some excellent territory here. I'm always aware that people tend to listen to the shorter episodes more. So uh, is there anything else that you'd like to kind of discuss or plug or what have you before we sign off? Well, I, I think if I was going to plug anything, it's, you know, if you do check out the podcast, uh, feedback. I mean, if you ch- check out the, the any of the things I'm doing, I'm I'm still pretty new at this, right? I haven't been doing, going at it too long. I've got a kind of model where I'm trying to interview and talk to real, you know, scientists, lecturer, t- scientists, uh, experts, and p- and community leaders and things like that. But if you've got any feedback, uh, I mean, obviously you can feedback on audio quality if you want and all that too. But I'm more interested in feedback and sort of design and and content. Well, uh, thanks very much for joining me for this conversation today, David. Uh, very much appreciated and uh, enjoyed it a lot. Yeah, well, thank, thanks for uh, having me on. And I, I, it's my pleasure, and I really, really enjoyed the conversation. If you'd like to support programs like this in the future, you may do so by going to taijireality.substack.com, where you can sign up for free to get notifications about... Well, any content that I produce. Or you can go to patreon.com slash taijireality 
and select your tier. Otherwise, I would appreciate uh, anything you might do along the lines of hitting like buttons, uh, rating on the Apple Store, leaving a comment at, uh, at Apple Podcasts, on YouTube, what have you. All that kind of stuff definitely helps to uh, give me the incentive to continue producing this content. Thanks very much.